Seahawks fans, wherever you may be. Thanks for listening to the show. Join your hosts, Bill Alfstead and Keith Myers, as we talk Seahawks football. Hey, hi, Seahawks fans. Welcome back to another episode of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Alfstead, sitting down with co-host Keith Myers, here to talk Seahawks football. And uh, we're into our part two of our multi-part series, looking at position groups on the team. This week is the running back position. Welcome in, Keith. How you doing? Doing good. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's been um, been an interesting weekend since we talked last. Um, Seahawks rookie minicamp happened. Um, not that there's much to talk about there because, you know, there's no pads and it's mostly just them teaching. But, um, yeah, just a lot of stuff to to, to look over and, and see how different guys did and, and um couple of interesting things in terms of where certain rookies lined up that might be interesting to talk about yeah yeah no i mean we can talk about that a little bit you know i really didn't uh, take too much news out of those camps just like you um everyone's just kind of running through uh different things um what, what did you have in mind well i thought it was interesting that um haynes the seattle's third round pick um played at right guard not at left guard um, when yeah. he is yeah. expected apparently to compete with uh, Bradford for the um, starting job initially, um, rather than having him, you know, at left guard where you could possibly get both the young players on the field um, right away. But so apparently they, yeah. the Seahawks are thinking that Lakin Tomlinson is, you know, the guy on the left for now. Well, and La Mea, is, they, they've got him penciled there. Now, I've been hearing some interesting things about La Mea as far as a guy that could be potentially um, earn, earn a starting spot sooner rather than later. Um, now, I know Tomlinson's got the experience, all that kind of stuff. He probably will start the year. Um, but they've got La Mea starting there, um, taking reps over there. Mm-hmm. Um, which, and, and then, you know, it makes sense for now. Get those guys, you know, on the field. They want to see them in their natural positions. Lumea, you know, probably was a, a right guard fit as well, but they're going to try him over there anyway and see what happens. Yeah, I just thought it was interesting that they, um, because, you know, we saw Bradford last year and he played pretty well. Uh, and, you know, they drafted uh, Haynes this year to kind of fix the interior. Well, you don't fix the interior by replacing one of your better players. You know what I mean? <laughs> you fix it yeah. by replacing one of your worst players, which, to me means that he should be playing on the left side. So, um, yeah, we'll see how yeah, Tomlinson does when, you when, take when a, OTAs happen. When you take a look at really Anthony Bradford, um, you know, he didn't really grade out that great. I think that he is in a position where he is kind of upgradable, if you will. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm having a hard time with this microphone today. I'm trying to get it all set so that people can hear me. So if you can't, for some reason, let me know. Um, yeah, I think that um, what I was saying about Bradford was that, you know, if you take a really close look at him from last year, it's like he was he was honestly mediocre. Now, there's certainly room for growth there, Keith, obviously, because the kid is a rookie, started 10 games last year. Um, did fairly well in the run blocking aspect of the game, but in pass blocking, he was less than average. Um, and so, I don't know. I think Christian Hage is definitely an upgrade over there. Um, so if he's going to start right away, that would be interesting. Anthony Bradford might be able to move over to the left side. I'm not sure. Um, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess I just expect Bradford to improve and be better. He came in as a um, mid round pick and, and had to battle just to get on the field. And, you know, especially in the, as, as a run blocker, he did pretty well. Um, there's a lot to like in his tape, even if it wasn't overall, Mm -hmm. you know, stellar, he was getting his first snaps as a pro. So, um, yeah, I liked, uh, what I saw out of him for the most part last year. I just think that, um, and I'm not sure if Lake and Tomlinson's going to be better. We'll see. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about this. So in, in theory, Keith, we should have a pretty amazing running game. 
um, in practice. You know, Shane Waldron, along with offensive line coach Cunningham last year, couldn't produce really anything even moderately successful. Mm-hmm. Um, that should have been one of the strengths that we have had going into the season. And I just thought, based on the improvement that we should have seen, it just didn't it didn't materialize. Um, didn't seem to be any coordinated effort to find any rhythm in the game. Um, and we just never gained any traction, you know, during games, most games. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I don't know what to expect this year. Are you confident that Ryan Grubb can come in with Scott Huff, the new offensive line coach, and produce more of a productive ground game, considering the talent we have at running back? Um, I do. I think that, I mean, a lot of the problems last year were, were they were offensive line related. Um, you know, the interior was weak, but also right tackle, which had been a strength the year before, was an issue because um, Abe Lucas's knee just was never fully up to strength and he couldn't get back to the level he was as a rookie. So he had that surgery. I think uh, he'll be ready to go. Plus they've upgraded his backup, you know, going, uh, bringing Fant in to be that swing tackle instead of having foresight there. So uh, I think that overall they're going to, they're in a position to be better, as far as blockers go and there's considerable talent at the running backs position. So they, they really should be able to get that ground game going. If they can't, then we might need to just reevaluate what they're doing, the kind of scheme they're using, the the matching of players to scheme, that kind of stuff, because there's no Mm -hmm. reason why this ground game doesn't get going this year. Well, Ken Walker is our lead running back. He had a thousand yards as a rookie campaign came in last year at about 900 uh, a little over 900 yards and about the same amount of carries. Um, he had uh, essentially nine carries less than his rookie season, but gained a thousand yards less average uh, 4.1 yards per carry last year, 4.6 is rookie season, um, eight rushing touchdowns last year, nine is rookie season, um, had about the same amount of receptions. Uh, I was looking for him to kind of step forward um this last year and just never really saw that um and and so it ended up being a little bit more disappointing than you'd like it to to be and then i thought zach charbonnet was kind of underutilized a little bit um he, he got some touches but again nothing ever really amounted to to much of anything in this in this game with the with the run blocking that we had and and you know that that made me question not the running backs. Cause I know the running backs were super talented. It was just kind of like, I thought Cunningham was going to be that, that offensive line coach we all dreamed of. He did so well in producing, uh, those two rookie, uh, tackles, uh, the year prior. Um, and then everything just regressed. And I guess it was, it just came down to injuries really, um, mm-hmm. more, more than anything. And just that, you know, starting, you know, nine or 10 different, uh, combinations. Um, yeah, and almost it seemed like a new lineman every week in, into the starting lineup. And so that was that was difficult for sure. Yeah, Cross missed the first half of the season and then came back and struggled for a few weeks before finding his um, footing. Um, Damian Lewis actually started out okay, but then got progressively worse as the season went on. He got more and more banged up. Um, you know, Phil Haynes never amounted to much over there had to be replaced by Bradford who was a rookie and kind of learning on on the go they didn't have much to work with at center and right tackle you know Abe Lucas never looked like the Abe Lucas from the year before because of his knee and st- so Stone Forsyth did most of the playing over there and it wasn't pretty so honestly like there were problems all across the line last year and I think that has far more to do with the the problems in the running game than the running backs. I mean, we know that Ken Walker right. um, can, 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 can play. And um, Charbonnet has got a lot of talent and we saw that in his college tape. And we saw that, you know, at times, you know, he flashed a little bit last year, but not enough, didn't get enough carries. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that this offense could not stay on the field. They couldn't extend a drive. They couldn't get a third down conversion. And when you're doing that, you're not getting, uh, it's just the number of plays drops way down and therefore the number of runs drops down and they just couldn't get Charbonnet the ball regularly enough for him to get in any kind of groove. Um, it was really kind of a, a struggle overall. 
uh, for the the running game, but I I think it's just the offensive line just really struggling. So l- let's talk scheme a little bit. How do you have you looked at at Grubbs' offense and then you know the blocking schemes that are going to come in uh, with Huff and, and kind of you know we knew that the aerial attack at the University of Washington with Michael Penix was extremely capable. Uh, they had like 5,100 yards through the air in 2023 with led the nation. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but the root of that success, I think Ryan Grubb has always been his ra- his ground game, his ability to balance that attack with, with something on the ground. Last year they did it with Dylan Johnson at the University of yeah, Washington. Yeah. I mean, it helps when you yards. have, when you have Michael Penix and, um, Rama Duze, um, the eighth and ninth pick in the draft, you know, um, in your passing game. And plus the other two guys they had, uh, what is it? Polk and McMillan, um, were both also, you know, second day picks. Um, if I remember right. So there, there's a lot of talent there, uh, for within the passing game. So that's, I think part of the reason why the passing game was so successful, but even if you go back and you look pre university of Washington at his mm-hmm. other stops, Along the way, um, San Diego State, um, I think the other one was Wyoming. Um, yeah, he was a run first coordinator where his teams pounded together and, and just racked up the running yards. And that's one of the things that I like about him is because he demands a physical style. Um, he expects his team to kind of impose their will at the line of scrimmage. It's about toughness. It's about things that, um, help you win as games go on and so yeah they racked up a lot of yards last year but i don't know if that is uh indicative of what we're going to see i think we're going to see a lot more running than people think and you're right even when they did um throw the ball around a lot last year and have all those yards they still had a ground attack at all times teams had to respect that because otherwise he just pounded up the middle at you and, and, you know, run your guys over. Um, so you had to bring guys up, to stop that. And that's when he beat you over the top. So, um, it's a, it is a, a run first offense with a lot of pass, um, uh, options coming off of that. I think what I see is, um, it's much less zone, um, heavy as it was under Pete Carroll. And I said, I, not just Shane Waldron, but just all of Pete Carroll. He was very much um, a zone blocking guy. And that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to push guys wide rather than trying to push them back for the most part. And, um, you know, you look at Grubb's offense and it, it there's some so, of that. There is some so zone Grubb blocking schemes, to, but it's not. Yeah. So in the last five years as offensive coordinator, Brian Grubb, Brian Grubb likes to run both zone scheme and, and power. But his zone mm-hmm. concepts totaled about sixty-five percent of of the rate, thirty-five percent power. So he runs essentially two, mm-hmm. um, you know, to kind of mix it up a little bit: inside zone, outside zone, power, um, pulling. Um, I mean, you can go into it, you know, a little bit more in, in in detail if you want. But they do, you know, toss sweeps and and power, and they do. Um, what was I going to say? I had it written down here. Sorry. Pin and pull concepts, counter counter mm-hmm. trays, wide traps, gaps, power concepts, you know, all that kind of stuff is part of his repertoire. Which um, is stuff stuff they most of which they didn't do under Pete Carroll. Like all the so different coor- all the different coordinators. That. It was mostly um inside zone, inside zone, inside zone, inside, and maybe throw an outside zone here or there. Um it was ninety five percent zone. Well, very this little is power. definitely they weren't where, where, it, where it comes into Huff's blocking schemes because it, it ties into that and what kind of personnel we have. Mm-hmm. So my next question is, with, with Huff, do we have the right personnel to implement what they want to do? Or are they adaptable? Are they going to say, this is what Charles Cross can do and, and um, Bradford and Tomlinson and Haynes and Abe Lucas and we're going to adapt and we're going to do what these guys do best. And we'll just slowly implement this stuff over the next two or three years. It's hard to tell. 
because um, Lakin Tomlinson is power almost exclusively. He's a put a guy in a he's in a phone booth and he's really good against the guy straight across from him, but he doesn't have a lot of lateral. So he's not a guy that's built for for the zone stuff. Bradford um, has a lot of power and, and I think would benefit from moving to a more power system. But Oluwatimi at center is much more of a um, zone blocking guy. And the two tackles, honestly, they can both do either. Um, I like to think of Lucas as more of a zone blocking kind of guy and and, Char- and Charles Cross as being a guy that can um, really be multiple. Um, ultimately, what it's going to come down to is who's playing, right? Because um, Haynes, the, the rookie, is much more versatile than Bradford and mm-hmm. Tomlinson. That's very true. Yeah. Um, and, and he can, can succeed in either scheme. And so... Um, who who wins the jobs who's playing who's not hurt this week i think ultimately what it comes down to is they just want to be multiple they don't want to be hey this is what we do it's you aren't going to know what we're going to do you can't just settle in and go okay here's my one read because um that makes it too easy he wants the guys to be able to do all sorts of different things and and be be multiple about it and can you teach can you teach that enough before the 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 first snap in the, in the first game. I don't know. It's hard. It's a lot. It is. It's hard um, to implement in one off season. It really is. Now, if you assume that all of the returning guys know the zone stuff, so you're really just teaching um, Tomlinson that, and he's a vet. He's, I'm. he's seen it in the past. Mm-hmm. He just, it's not what he's built for, but he's, he still knows it. If you assume they know that and you're only implementing he had it, he played under that in San Francisco. Yeah. So you only implement the, um, you know, the, the power elements to it. You can, um, you might be able to, I still just think with, with everything that's new, an entirely new offense, new terminology, new everything. Um, it's going to be really hard to implement the entirety of, multiple scheme um uh, in the running game and and yeah. get them all working in one off season. It's well, especially lot. when you throw in the the you know the 11 personnel versus the 12 versus 13, one running back, one tight end versus two tight ends. Um yep. sometimes you're going to have a, an extra tight end and and he's going to act like a fullback. I mean, it's just it's going to be kind of an interesting uh implementation um on our personnel it'll be interesting and we've also we've added a ton of uh, guys uh, on the offensive line uh percher jarrell i don't know if he's gonna make the roster but he, you know they drafted him haynes um la mea uh like in tomlinson tremaine ankrum so i mean there's a lot of guys and new guys that you're integrating as well and so mm-hmm. let's let's get back to the running back conversation keith because that's kind of um the basis of the show um all things being equal, how much talent do we have on this roster? At running back, we've got two really good ones. And then. <laughs> and, and then after that, we don't know. There's, yeah. um, you know, a couple of uh, future contract undrafty kind of guys that are hanging around that if they make the team, they'll uh, only play if they're good at special teams, um, unless a whole bunch of injuries happen. Um, and then you've got in Macintosh, a guy that, um, was a seventh round pick a year ago and then didn't play last year cause he was injured all year. Um, that has some talent, has some experience, has, um, some things to like as a third down back a guy that can receive the ball out of the backfield, you know, those kind of things, uh, but doesn't offer you much between the tackles and is incredibly slow according to his combine times. Um, mm-hmm. We don't we don't know if there's going to be much to work with there, or if that was an absolute steal in the draft when they they drafted him. Um, we'll see. But other than those top two guys, what else is there? Like it's it's hard to look at that position and be like, yeah, there's depth. I just I don't see. Well, depth. I mean, Kenny McIntosh was picked in the seventh round for a reason. Two thirty seven overall, six foot two oh eight. You mentioned the slow speed four six two forty. But he's got quick feet. I mean, you look at him on tape, he's got quick feet. Um, he didn't burst away from anybody, really, but he's got a nice little burst. So he's, he can get through a hole, get into a space, and then he's going to, you know, most likely going to get chased down. But he's going to give you some chunk plays. 
he's not going to give you some home run threat. Um, that's the thing about, you know, out of the backfield. He's got all that production out of the backfield, catching the ball out of the backfield. But he's not really going to take any of those to the to the house. Um, so, he's, he's you know, he's a good value back for you to have on the roster, kind of does, does everything. But they may want to take a look at, you know, a player eventually. No, they didn't invest in, in, in the draft in a running back. Um, and, and they may want to upgrade that position at, at some point. But we'll see. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if they had a bet to this room um, you know, before training camp or during training camp. George uh, Holani is the running back that's kind of the, the penciled in as the fourth guy. He's an undrafted rookie free agent, 24 years old, turned 24 in December, so older prospect, 5'10", 208, ran a 4'5", 240, so he's not blistering good enough for you. Um, one five seven split, thirty nine inch vertical though, and twenty four inch reps means he's explosive and he's strong. Um, but he's had a history of of injuries, like he had mm-hmm. a, a left ACL injury, and then lower body injuries, miss significant time each year in college. And he's a fifth year senior. Um, he is a one cut and go running back. I like his 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 play style. He doesn't bounce around a lot. He just makes a decision and he goes. So he's kind of decisive that way, but. I don't know what you've got in George Helani. He's probably got a draftable grade, but he went undrafted primarily from the injury concerns, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just, uh, it's hard to, hard to know. Like um, we're looking at, we're talking about guys that they may not even be on, be on the roster um, at the start of camp, let alone at the end of camp. Um, and where, I was surprised they didn't draft a running back. I know they drafted one in each of the last two years and running backs don't have a lot of value anymore. Um, and there's a lot of belief that you can get guys at either at the end of the draft or undrafted um, that can come in and do the job well enough. Um, but as a team that wants to have that physical identity that a power run game gives you, um, you got to have bodies because guys yeah. will get hurt. I agree. That's it's why I think of, we're going to have a, a, a vet come in. Yeah. Rashad uh, Penny was rumored to be uh, available and he did visit with them, but he ended up signing today somewhere else. So he's yeah. not an option anymore. Um, I wouldn't have been against um, Penny coming in on a, a league minimum deal. Um, I either. Because we saw for six games that he can be a dominant player he just can't stay healthy. But if he's your fourth option, right, you just got him stashed waiting in case somebody gets hurt. Well, you don't need him to, um, you know, be healthy for a season. You need him to be healthy for three games. Well, um, you know, your guys get healthy around him. So I, I didn't, I, I wouldn't have hated, hated that because the talent is there when healthy. Um, but the fact that the Seahawks were looking, the fact that they they called him, they brought him in, um, they were working on that. Someone else offered him a little bit more um, money. Tells you that John Snyder recognizes that they need to add in this um, in this area. So Ryan, Ryan Grubb said, we're going to be a physical team on the offensive side of the ball. Um and he, he said, um, and over the years, that's something that we've certainly done. When the components are all matched up, we run the ball very effectively, and I look forward to it. I think that when you have an established run game, it makes calling those other plays, the auxiliary plays off of it, a lot easier, honestly. It's when you don't have the presence of a run game, things can get really tricky. And then, but they didn't invest into the running back room, really. They, you know, they, they, they looked at their film. They saw what they've got. Obviously, Ken Walker and Zach Charbonnet are are really good mm-hmm. i think it really comes down to the the, the blocking i mean we've just <laughs> we keep going back to this but it's like it's crazy um they did pick up aj barner to help out as a, a blocking tight end tyler mabry's been kind of a blocker Farrell brown's a blocking tight end so that they they're pretty good there um i'm just so curious as to how this thing's going to work out as far as scheme is concerned on the blocking end because really that's i think the difference for me um, the talent was there last year and it, it just didn't show up in the game. And then we'll see what happens this year. I just, I, I, I so want to be able to say talent wise, 
we've got a team that could win 10, 10 games, 10, 11 games on paper. And I'm thinking, this is just so new. It's a new scheme. It's a new offense. It's a new head coach. It's a new defense. Um, I, I, I really want to lower expectations, but my, my heart does not want to do that because I expect, you know, greatness out of this team. And I just don't know how we're going to be able to be successful. Just looking at, I mean, we've got the offensive linemen in, in name, but in practice, I'm just not sure. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. So mm-hmm. anything else you want to cover in this show? Um, so there is an unrestricted free agent uh, running back out there whose name I think you might be interested in Seattle bringing in. Oh, yeah. Um, Cam Akers. Hmm. Interesting. He got non-tendered by the Vikings um, after, I mean, the Rams traded him. He went to the Vikings. He did some good stuff in Minnesota for a couple of weeks and then found himself not getting a lot of playing time and then got non-tendered. Um, and so there's something weird there, but this is a guy with came out with a lot of talent and um, at the end of his rookie year in uh, LA with the Rams, he really turned it on and was, was 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 really tough to bring down and made a lot of plays for them but yeah. i i don't know if it's off the field um stuff or you know work ethic stuff around the the around the building but he has definitely fallen out of favor with two um different franchises but man that is a lot of um that is a lot of uh, potential talent just sitting there and he's 25. Yeah, I, I do like that, but man, having washed out a couple different teams and stuff and then still being out there, I'm just not sure. Galvin Cook's still out there, which I've been just signed. Joshua Kelly, uh, Latavius Murray, he's got that bigger back kind of, uh, but he's Kareem older Hunt. Now. Yeah, he's Kareem Hunt is, um, has been a kind of a an issue and a locker room kind of issue guy. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure they would touch that. Jarek McKinnon and uh, Brita are out there. Mm-hmm. Brita's really fast, but he's older now. Yeah, there's a couple there's of not, guys. There's not, not much there. Melvin Gordon. Ugh. Yep. Yeah, but it really it. comes down to as far as like guys of a reasonable age um, that aren't old. Um, man, I, I, I just look at and I see um uh, acres just sitting there and i'm like that would be fun it would be a lot of fun you know there are a lot of running backs free agent signed this this off season i mean like mm-hmm. 25 or 30 backs changed teams yeah um and and seattle didn't opt to sign a single one of them which is which is just interesting to me you know i think i think it, they they did kind of commit to investing into the trenches this year they did and I, I think that's going to be the important play is to find out if this really made a difference up front um and, and see if we can create because you know a guy like charbonnet keith he's not ken walker ken walker can kind of create some, mm-hmm. some space for himself and, and move around bounce things out charbonnet needs a little bit more time to allow a run blocking play to develop before he hits the yeah. hole Otherwise, he he's, that speed he's, and he's, explosiveness. He, yeah, he, he pushes he's got himself up power. into a line and he kind of gets stuffed. And, and, yeah, you know, you, you see him break away once in a while if things kind of open up. Um, but he needs, I think, he needs better blocking up front in order for him to be successful. And I'd like to see that um, mm-hmm. because he's definitely got the talent once he gets out into space. Yeah, that was one of the things about the Pete Carroll era is they just never seemed to care about the offensive line enough. Um, and it was just constantly a problem uh, from the very beginning. I mean, they had uh, a really nice line in in the first couple of years and, and yeah. won a Super Bowl and then promptly started trading. Uh, they traded away um, 
you know, their, their Pro Bowl center um, in order to get Jimmy Graham in here and then didn't want to pay for Russell Okung and then just kept going cheap on the offensive line. And they did it kind of the whole time um, mm-hmm. after that. And they never really fixed things. And so um, really didn't make any kind of commitment to it until they drafted the two tackles a couple of years ago. Um, and that paid off. Um, yeah. New regime, new emphasis. Let's see if they can get some, um, fix the blocking. And I really think like, you're right. Charbonnet is not going to be the guy that's going to um, make someone miss, bounce it outside and take it to the house. He's not that guy. He's a power runner. He's going to take the ball between the tackles. He's going to get up field. He's going to um, punish a linebacker and fall forward for seven or eight yards. Like that's who he is at his best. Um, And to that, you need a little bit of a hole. You need to give him something to work with. And then once you do that, he can turn it into more than, than, than the blocking was worth. Um, And I think that's why we didn't see much of him last year was because they needed someone who could turn nothing into something. And that's Walker has that ability. Um, You know, Huff comes in with, with the reputation of being one of the best offensive line coaches in college football. He had the best offensive line in college football. Um, And I have my fingers crossed that he can take this unit and really kind of transform it in one year. Um, Mm -hmm. we mentioned all those different blocking uh, concepts and, 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 um, integrated with different running concepts and, and and there's a lot to learn there, but maybe they can just kind of dumb this thing down this first year and just really get good at at a few different things. Um, and then expand that as the year goes on or, or next year. Um, cause I, I think we've got some good, good talent at running back. There's no question. And Ken Walker, you know, this is going to be his third year. He's only under contract for another year after that. Um, I'd love, love to be able to have him have, have a real successful year. Because I think if, if we're going to be, be successful as an offense, they need to be able to run the ball. I think last year they ran the ball 60. They, they threw the ball 65% of, yeah. the, of the plays, only ran the ball 35%. That's, um, that's a little wonkish. It is, but at the same time, like they were so bad at running the ball. Like then I they get were playing from behind. Yeah. They're, they they just weren't a good running team. So you're not going to force it. Now there were other times where they were running the ball well and they went away from it, but I think they went away from it in part because if you're only getting a few plays per drive, like you're trying to get as much yards slash points as possible. And um, you don't want to give up plays, you know, running the ball for three yards when you may you know, on average, you're only getting four or five yards or four or five plays per drive. So, um, they went away from, from a little bit from that, that perspective as well. But, uh, yeah, I, this is a team that if they're going to do well, they've got to be able to extend some drives, which they could not do last year. And to do that, it helps if you can run the ball effectively. It's not running the ball just to run the ball doesn't help you unless you can run it effectively, unless you can get, you know, um, yards. If your running backs are averaging, you know, four and a half yards per carry. Um, yeah. Then run it all you want. Um, and, but they weren't doing that last year for a lot of last year. They were, they were struggling mm-hmm. to get back to the line of scrimmage. Yeah. Yeah. No, no doubt. I mean, you know, Ken Walker forced 56 missed tackles last year, fifth in the NFL but still only average 4.1 yards per carry. Yeah. Um, yeah. So a lot of his rushes were stuck mm-hmm. and, and Charbonnet as well. Charbonnet would either, it seemed like Charbonnet would either have a 10 yard run or nothing. Mm-hmm. Like it was, it was, it was kind of feast or famine. All right. So let's, let's get out of here. Um, I, I have my hopes up fingers crossed that the blocking is going to be the difference this year. And we'll see yeah. how that goes. Um, yeah, I think next week, are we doing tight ends or wide receivers? I can't remember. Um, but, uh, we're, we're, we're going through all the position groups, uh, offense first and then defense. So I uh, hope you guys come back and join us for all of those shows. You can find Keith on Twitter at Myers NFL. You can find me at NW Seahawk, the show Seahawk playbook podcast. 
on your favorite podcast platform and our YouTube channel. Hit that subscribe button, share it, leave us a comment, and um, we'll see you next time. So go Hawks. Go Hawks. Seahawks Playbook Podcast listeners, thanks for joining us for another edition of the show. You can find us on Twitter. Bill is at NW Seahawk. Keith is at Myers NFL. And the show is at Hawks Playbook. You can listen and subscribe to the show at SeahawksPlaybook.com.